Would you bow with me once more? Lord, it's both an exciting challenge and a humbling privilege to open your word together. So I simply ask that by your spirit you would speak to us in ways that we can understand. Open our ears and our hearts that we might hear and respond. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, I think most of us would agree most of the time that growth is a good thing. I think we would agree that it's the very nature of living things to grow. It's good when plants grow, when children grow, when companies grow, and when churches grow. It's a good thing. But I think we would also probably all agree that growth can sometimes, maybe often, maybe always, bring certain growing pains. That is, growth can bring problems. For example, a tree can grow to the point where the branches need to be cut back. This one, they waited a little too long to trim back. Um, as companies grow, so do complications. Some of you have jobs because you're good at figuring out complications in production or payroll or insurance or HR. When children grow, it's a very, very good thing. But with that growth comes growing pains. New clothes and bigger shoes every year. You should see the bins of shoes we have at our house. Before you know it, it's time for a driver's license and then car insurance. There can be that relational tug of war that often marks the adolescent years. Then it's figuring out how to pay for college. So even though growth is good, it inevitably brings some problems, sometimes painful problems. It's true for the church as well. Here at FBCG, we've been blessed with uh, almost uninterrupted growth in one way or another for about 20 years now. From a church family of about 500 to now more than 4,000 men, women, and children. Along the way, we've experienced our share of blessings, but also our share of growing pains. Communication becomes much more difficult. Connecting people to one another is much more challenging than it was 20 years ago. We've needed to learn how to hire staff. We've had to invest in facilities. We're doing that right now. So growth is good, but growth brings problems. So this weekend, we continue our study in the book of Acts, but we begin a new series within the larger series. This series is called Growing Pains, Reaching Brings Problems. Now, this is the second section of your Acts journal. So if you picked one of those up already or you're taking your notes in it, we're in the second portion of it now in, this, in the second series of our study in the book of Acts. Now, a brief review as we begin this new series. Chapter 1, Jesus gives a mandate, you will be my witnesses to the very ends of the earth. Chapter 2, the promised Holy Spirit comes and fills the disciples, the followers of Jesus, with power, and they begin to speak in languages they've never studied. Uh, and then 3,000 people come to faith after Peter preaches. Chapter 3, we see the miraculous healing of the man born lame. Peter then preaches again following the healing and calls for repentance. And now we have a group of more than 5,000 who have believed in Jesus Christ. Now we come to chapter 4. And we're going to take this slightly out of order. I'm going to jump in sort of the middle of the chapter. Next weekend, Jeff will take you back to the beginning of this chapter. But let me just give you a little summary so you know where we are. Uh, the religious authorities become very troubled over what happened following the healing of the lame man. When they see Peter preaching and people flocking to put their faith in this Jesus of Nazareth. So Peter and John are immediately arrested by the authorities, held overnight in prison. They're questioned. But the authorities recognize that a genuine miracle has taken place. They can't argue with that. And they fear that Peter and John's popularity has become so great with the people that they can't really do anything to them. So that what they do is they warn them. They warn them sternly, stop teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus or else. And then they release them. So now we pick it up, Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. Let me read these verses to you. You can look on the screen or in your own personal Bible. When they were released, talking about Peter and John, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, 
who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now we're going to stop there. The first thing I see in this portion of Scripture is the response of prayer. The response of prayer. Most of you know, I'm sure all of you know by now, that a couple of weeks ago uh, we lost our friend and colleague, Pastor Roger Kreitz, after a 13-year battle with cancer. It's obvious, obviously a time of great loss and grief for his family, the whole entire Kreitz family and their friends. It's a loss for our church family as well. Uh, but as often is the case when a faithful servant of Jesus passes away, it has also been a time of deep appreciation and, and sweet remembrance. If you were at his service a week ago Monday, you know what I'm talking about. And one of the stories that emerged, um, actually I was in conversation with Jan, his wife, uh, afterward, um, that I found especially uh, meaningful had to do with how Roger spent uh, his many hours hooked up to a dialysis machine. You might not know, but for the last six or seven years of his life, Roger was on full-time dialysis. He had no kidneys left due to the cancer, so he had dialysis three times a week for five hours each time, early in the morning. Five hours each time, three times a week for the last seven years, hooked up to a machine just so he could live. But rather than use that time reading or watching TV or movies or even sleeping, he had to get up at four in the morning or so for that, Roger tended to spend that time praying. Now, if you know Roger, it doesn't really surprise you, but I thought about that. And Jan said he spent most of that time praying, and he didn't pray just generally. He prayed specifically. He kept long lists of every single FECG family, uh, staff member. We have 55 of us, and we all have families. He prayed for every staff member and every family member of those staff members by name every time he was at dialysis. So his response to a most uncomfortable, most undeserved, and very painful circumstance was prayer. Here we see four things about the prayer of these early believers. First, they prayed together. Luke says, when they were released, John and Peter, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. Now, prayer is a very personal experience. When Roger prayed there, just he and the dials machine, it was personal and private, and it should be, and that's good. But prayer is also a relational experience. We are intended to pray not just when we are alone, but when we are together. Notice, Luke does not say they went to the other apostles. He says he went, they went to their friends. Literally, it means to their own it means uh, referring, he's referring here to the ragtag group of followers of Christ who had been gathered together in the recent weeks. People from every background, people who spoke different languages, people came, who came from different strata of society. He's talking about the, the whole community that was called the church. See, I think it's important to know this wasn't a group of professional ministers. This wasn't a group of professional prayers, as it were. It wasn't an elite group of spiritual leaders. This was just a group of ordinary folks. Many brand new to the faith, brand new to Jesus. Many who had never, ever prayed this way before. An 18th century biblical commentator named Matthew Henry said it this way, Christ's followers do best in company, he said. Christ followers do best in company. Remember, in Acts 2, we saw that the early believers were devoted to the fellowship. We said that word fellowship was the Greek word koinonia, the sharing of life. But here's what it looks like with regard to prayer. This is simply a gathering of people who believed in Jesus, who loved each other, and were facing growing pains. 
They're facing threats and persecution for the first time. They're realizing it could be dangerous to claim Jesus as Lord in their culture. And their response is prayer. Now, how do we do this today? We live in a very different time and culture. We live, I believe, at a velocity as a people unmatched in human history. Uh, We are far more spread out than they were in the first century world. We can't just walk to each other's homes. We can't just walk to church in a couple of minutes like they could. We live in a much different culture. But how do we do this? Still, we are to pray together. Now here at FBCG, we do this in a variety of ways. And many of you are involved in these prayer groups. Most of our weekday ministries include small group times where prayer is shared. Those committed to what we call C groups, meeting each other's homes regularly, and part of that is prayer together. Women pray together in dozens of Bible study groups. Men pray together right here in this room at Team on Friday morning. We pray together at our senior staff meetings every Wednesday morning. We have an online prayer community called I Pray. Go to fbcg.com. You can join this I Pray community and know about prayer requests as they happen. Sort of a high-tech prayer group. It's why we have our prayer team available following every one of our public worship services because there's something powerful and good and ancient and biblical about praying with another. So let me just urge you, if you don't have a place in your life to pray with others, find such a place through your church home. Learn not just to pray on your own, but to pray with others. It's a powerful experience. Secondly, notice they acknowledge the sovereignty of God. Their prayer begins, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. I think we need to notice this, because sometimes I think we are so quick to get to the asking part of our prayers that we can forget the worship part of prayer. Sometimes we kind of gloss over or take for granted who it is we are talking to when we pray. Pastor John Piper has written, it's remarkable that these Christians take five verses to tell God who he is and two verses to ask him what they want from him. Now God does not need to to be told who he is, but we as Christians, we need to know who he is. And precisely in our prayers, we need to know and confess that he is the kind of God who can and will answer our prayers. That's good stuff. Notice they identify two things about God. He's the creator of all things. Verse 24, sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Why why do they appeal to the creator of all things? Well, because they know if God created everything that is, if all the mountains and all the trees and all the seas belong to him, then also the elders and the priests, those who arrested Peter and John and were breathing out threats against them, they belong to him too. And he can do with them as he pleases, creator of all things. Which leads to the second thing they identify about God. He is sovereign, sovereign Lord. God didn't just wind up the universe and turn it loose. He did create it, but he's also sovereign in control of time and history itself. Nothing surprises him. He knows the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. Nothing can thwart his ultimate purposes, not even the deeds of evil men. So they trusted the sovereignty of their God even in times of struggle and pain. Thirdly, notice they prayed using Scripture. They used Scripture. They continue, Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? Now we can miss this altogether, but they are quoting here from Psalm 2 where David says, why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? Now, a couple things you need to see here. First, Scripture, or particularly the Psalms, can provide a guide for our prayer. The book of Psalms, Psalms is a collection of songs and poems and prayers that reads kind of like an ancient hymn book or an ancient prayer book. And I happen to believe that the book of Psalms is a great way to learn to pray. If you've never been taught to pray on your own, with your own thoughts, the book of Psalms can be a great guide. It can add richness to your experience of prayer, even if you've been praying all your life. It includes psalms of worship and devotion. We sang one tonight. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. 
It includes Psalms, uh, prayers of desperation and deliverance. Psalm 42, my tears have been my food day and night. Ever felt like that? There's a psalm for you in the Bible. There are prayers in the Psalms that are seething with bitterness and anger and pain. In fact, I've often encouraged those going through deep grief or deep pain of some sort to go to the Psalms and begin reading through the Psalms until they read one that says what's in their heart because they'll find one. It's all there. Every human emotion, the Psalms, they are praying using God's Word as a guide. Second, notice that they find in Scripture a confirmation of what is currently happening to them. As they continue, they say, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. In other words, God's people have always faced opposition and threat. King David faced enemies who desired his destruction. He wrote about them in the Psalms. Peter and John had been arrested and threatened. Jesus was put on trial by sinful men. But God in his sovereignty rules even over the sinful deeds of men and causes them to sort of backfire. And in his sovereign will, Jesus, God eventually raised Jesus from the dead and through him calls the world to salvation. Now, what we see here is the ground of confidence behind this powerful kind of prayer. The early Christians believed that God's hand was at work, even in their persecution. They trusted his sovereignty. God allowed it for his purposes, and God would end it in his time for his purposes. Fourthly, notice, we're still talking about their prayer here. They acknowledge the problem. So only after they had They had begun with God's sovereignty only after they gathered together, only after they went to Scripture. Now they talk about their problem. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Peter and John are arrested, thrown in prison. They've been warned to stop teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus. This is a very real threat. Now imagine... Uh, for yourselves. We have a hard time imagining this in our culture, but imagine for yourself that you, uh, on Monday, mor- Monday morning of next week, you are told by wherever you work, uh, we know you're a Christian, and we want you to know that if, you, if we find out you've gone to church again, or we find out you've even read your Bible, you're going to be fired. No questions asked, you're going to be fired. What would you do? What would that feel like to be under that kind of threat? Or what if the threat was prison? What if the threat was your children would be moved from your home? There are places in the world today where that is a very real threat. This is the threat to Peter and John. It's to all the believers, to the very survival of the church and the preaching of the gospel. And what's their response? Prayer. Prayer. So what what are our threats today? We know that our brothers and sisters around the world are threatened with persecution that we can't even begin to understand. I read on a website today that Christians are now believed to be the largest persecuted religious minority in the world. Not here in in our country, but in many places in the world. What about us? We can point to a growing apathy in our culture. We might even point to a growing hostility toward the gospel in our culture. The church and those who believe the Bible are becoming more and more the target of ridicule. We could talk about that. It's, It's real. But I think the far greater danger for us, the far greater threat for us, is what I might call distraction. Distraction. We're a hurried, harried, hyper-busy, stressed-out, distracted people. We can scarcely take care of our own business, let alone focus on the kingdom of God. We struggle to keep our calendars straight, let alone think about reaching, connecting, equipping, and serving our neighbor. So what is our prayer? Is our prayer to deliver us from our situation? Or is our prayer to make us more effective in our situation? And that leads us to the second point we see in this passage, which is a surprising request. Surprising request. Uh, Last spring, you might remember, I talked a little bit about this, a friend of mine named Tom Randall, uh, who was a career missionary to the Philippine Islands, now a pastor at my brother's church in Ohio, was arrested while on a trip to uh, visit ministry partners in the Philippines. To make a very long and scary story short, uh, Tom was falsely accru- accused of some horrific crimes 
And due to the way the law works in the Philippines, he was immediately thrown into prison, and he had to try to defend himself from prison. Uh, prison conditions were both harsh and extremely dangerous. Temperature was over 100 degrees inside the cells. Prisoners were jammed together, 30 and 40 men to one cell. Violence was rampant. On several occasions, Tom's life was in very real jeopardy just from violence. But Tom saw things a bit differently. He didn't want to be in prison. He knew the accusations were false. But he also trusted that God would work and that e even through that terrible situation. So Tom, who knew the language well and the culture well, started ministering to fellow prisoners. He started ministering. He started sharing the gospel with them. Even as thousands around the world were praying for his release, Tom started sharing the gospel with these men who were in prison. And he did so with, even with the guards. As word got out, thousands began to pray. Some of you began to pray. Uh, but, and Tom was able to uh, use his cell phone sporadically to communicate with my brother. Uh, at one point, my brother said, Tom had texted him and said, tell the people who are praying for me to pray that I won't get out too soon, he said. Because a lot of people are getting saved in prison, he said. Remar remarkable man. Uh, Tom has actually committed to come here and preach at FBCG at the end of our Acts series in May. Uh, I've asked him to come in, and he's graciously come. He'll preach two weekends back-to-back -back at the end of this whole series in May, so I'm looking forward to having him here. You, you won't forget hearing Tom Randall speak. Notice here a request for boldness. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Notice, they do not pray for God to judge their persecutors. They do not pray God would wipe out their enemies. They do not pray uh, for the persecution to be lifted, although that would not be a wrong thing to ask for. They ask God to consider these threats in other words, to pay attention to what's happening to them, but that what they really ask him for is to make them even bolder as his witnesses. They ask for more miracles to be done so that more crowds are drawn and they have more opportunity to share the gospel. This is what I'm calling revolutionary prayer. Ordinary prayer is, help me with this, help me with that, get me out of prison, deliver me from this terrible situation. And there's nothing wrong with that kind of prayer. God, our Father, wants us to come to him with our needs. But revolutionary prayer is, Lord, you know that I'm in prison. You know the accusations are false. I ask you to deliver, to deliver me, but while I'm here, use me to share your gospel. That's revolutionary. Revolutionary prayer is, Lord, you know I'm hooked up to this dialysis machine for the next five hours. Help me use this time to pray. To pray. Revolutionary prayer is not just asking for our situation to be changed. It's asking God to change us in the situation. You see the difference? And that leads us to the third part of this text, which is what I'm calling prayer and the Spirit. Prayer and the Spirit. On a recent trip uh, just a few weeks ago to visit a potential ministry partner in the Middle East, by the way, I discovered in the Middle East there's lots and lots of sand. <laughs> lots of sand. Uh, we were blessed to attend a prayer meeting at the uh, Dubai Evangelical Church. Uh, these are my uh, traveling partners, Pastor Bruce and Dave Levan, member of our executive council, our board. Uh, when we got to this prayer meeting on the last night I was there, the meeting had already begun when we arrived. There were about 30 people or so uh, sitting around this, this smallish room, uh, and they were worshiping as we walked in. A guy was playing a keyboard, electronic keyboard. Two women were singing up front. They were singing in Arabic, uh, but the spirit of the gathering uh, really needed no translation. They were lifting their voices and their hearts to Jesus. We felt at home. After 15 minutes or so of worship, they started to pray. Uh, but as they prayed, the keyboardist continued to play worship songs and chords and stuff behind their prayers. It made the whole thing feel kind of worshipful. And I noticed what you noticed right away was the intensity of the prayer. That's the best word I can use for it, just intense. I couldn't understand a word that was being said. It was all in Arabic. And even though I was fighting, sometimes unsuccessfully, the drowsiness of jet lag, um, I was caught up in the passion of the prayer. Uh, we were there for an hour and a half, and it never abated once. The, the, the intensity and the passion one after the other after the other. At one point, a man stood up to pray. Most of them were sitting. He stands up, and he's pacing, and he's praying. And he prayed with such force 
that I, I just had to ask the lady sitting next to me who understood Arabic. I leaned over and said, what? what's he praying about? What's he praying about? And she whispered back, he's asking God to pour out his spirit on the people in dreams and visions so they can know who Jesus is. And it struck me, sitting there in that room so far away, that these believers, most of whom had faced rejection and persecution from their own families, were not asking God to make their lives easier or better, but were rather asking Him to send the Holy Spirit to reach those who did not yet know Christ. That's revolutionary prayer. Back to the text. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. Several connections here I want you to make. First, notice the similarities with what happened in chapter 2 at the time of Pentecost. The believers all gathered together. Uh, They are in prayer. And God shows up in the person of the Holy Spirit. Wind, fire, and shaking. Something you can hear, the Spirit you can hear, the Spirit you can see, and the Spirit you can feel. They were filled with the Spirit, and they bore witness with boldness. The same pattern in both meetings. Second, notice the connection between prayer, the Spirit, and boldness. The experience of corporate prayer, that is prayer with others, whether it be a group of 2, 3, 4, 8, 47, or however many, seems to be the precursor, maybe even the prerequisite to the experience of the Spirit. Now, a word of Clarification here, as individual believers, we've already covered this, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. That's a promise and a guarantee. But this passage and many others seem to indicate that something unique happens when many individuals who have the Spirit dwelling within them gather together in the spirit of prayer. Something bigger happens. Now this is not another spirit. This is not some extra step in spirituality that we must take to really be saved. This is the same Holy Spirit that indwells our hearts, but what we see is that we can share extraordinary and powerful manifestations of that Spirit when we gather with others in prayer. Can we experience the Holy Spirit in powerful and intimate ways when we're by ourselves? Absolutely we can, and we should. But this text and many others tell us that our faith was not meant to be lived alone, but rather in the fellowship with others. I think we also learned something else about prayer here. Perhaps the primary role of prayer, and I'm just asking this, okay? Perhaps the primary role of prayer is not to make our lives easier. Maybe we've learned that from our culture. Maybe the role of prayer is to enable us to experience the Holy Spirit so that we might be shaken and made more bold. Maybe that's the purpose of prayer. In February of 2010, I actually had to look it up to find out what month it was, but in February 2010, Lorraine and I woke up in the very early morning hours, middle of the night, uh, to the sound of picture frames rattling on the walls. You may remember when this happened. Picture frames just rattling on the walls. We both woke up, what's happening, what's happening? It only lasted a few seconds, seemed like minutes. But what happened was there had been a, an earthquake in the DeKalb, centered in DeKalb. Not real strong, but enough to rattle the, the picture, uh, uh, pictures on our frames, uh, on our walls. The quake was minor. Floors didn't buckle, walls didn't fall, nothing even fell off the walls. Not much was written in the paper the next day, although it was, it was uh, identified. But to this day, we can remember the night we were shaken. Luke finishes the story, and when they had prayed, the place in which we were, they were gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. We're called to pray and to pray together. And when we pray together... We experience the Holy Spirit. And the role of the Spirit is to shake, to shake us, to shake us up, and to make us bold. Let me ask you two questions before I lead us in the time of prayer. Have you been shaken by the Holy Spirit? Have you ever prayed for boldness? For boldness. I want you to bow your heads now with me for a few moments as we close. Last week I gave you the opportunity to respond to a call to repentance, to turn to Jesus or return to Jesus, and many of you did. Today I think the Spirit wants to call us to prayer, 
specifically to the prayer of boldness. So where do you need spiritual boldness in your life today? Maybe in your family. Maybe there's someone living under your roof or in your family that's far from God. Maybe there's tension in a relationship. Can you pray tonight for boldness in love? Boldness in witness? Boldness in being a representative of Jesus in that family, in that situation? Ask him for boldness. Maybe in your work environment. Maybe with your friends. What would it mean for you to boldly bear witness to the gospel with your friends? Would it mean to invite someone to join you? Would it mean to serve someone? Would it mean to offer to pray for someone you know is struggling? To step out of your comfort zone? And what about for our church? Within five miles of these walls, there are 100,000 people who don't worship anywhere. How can we together be more bold right here where we are? Holy Spirit of Jesus, shake us. By your Spirit that blew like a wind, by your Spirit that appeared like fire, by your spirit that shook the room, by your spirit who emboldened those men and women so long ago. Shake us. Make us bold. Bold witnesses for your sake and for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.